Yes, correct. So, so this is supposed to be a general audience -ish talk. I'll start with something everybody knows, which was that for millennia, mankind wondered if Euclidean geometry was all there was, uh, which is strange, actually, because humans, even 2,000 years ago, lived on Earth, which is round. And apparently, this fact has escaped them. Because they actually measured non-trivial plots of land, right? And so you think they would actually notice that Euclidean uh, measurements don't quite work. But anyway, so there was a question about the independence of, parallel, of the parallel postulate, which is, as you will, I'm sure, recall, that in the plane, through every point, well, here's a line. If you have a point outside the line, there's only one line which is parallel, where parallel in this context means it's a unique line which doesn't meet our given line. And I guess from the time of actually Euclid, people were a little dubious about this because, it, like, is this really obvious? So they weren't sure about this. And people started screwing around, well, I'm not sure when, but certainly by the 17th century, I guess there was this guy, Sakeri, in Italy, who made some constructions to see, well, what would happen? He tried to prove it by contradiction. So he said, well, let's just assume this is not true, and let's make some constructions. And much to his amazement, it actually worked out pretty well. But he was a wimp, and therefore he just kept it in the drawer and uh, didn't tell anyone. The next wimp in the series was Gauss, who did pretty much the same thing, as far as I can tell. He, who figured this out, and then he kept it in a drawer, and he wasn't telling anyone. But notice that Gauss actually was the royal, not the royal, but the official as astronomer of well, wherever it is he was living, baden württemberg or something. And so sneakily, on the sly, he was measuring distances and angles between the stars to see if maybe, you know, if the stars tell him that that's actually what's going on, then he could tell people. Otherwise, he was keeping it on the QT, and it took some really stupid guys, which is Bogiai <laughs> and Lobachevsky, who apparently didn't care if people considered them insane, uh, to uh, actually publish. Whereupon Gauss, of course, immediately said, oh, yeah, I knew that. <laughs> but rightfully, he doesn't get any credit because he went out. And um, interestingly, actually, Boye was a cavalry officer or something, so you could expect him to do crazy things. But Lobachevsky, shortly thereafter, became the, I guess, the provost, the rector of a, of a, of a university. So you think he would be more politic. But anyway, and the example, the basic geometric example, is pretty simple. Because I'm not sure who, this is known as a Beltrami Klein model, but I'm not sure if, as usual, if you follow the Arnold dictum, it's probably true that neither Beltrami nor, nor Klein thought of this first. Um, so you represent hyperbolic plane, which we do know by H2. By the way, in all rational literature to this day, it's called Lobachevsky plane. But, uh, and so it's, and it's called L2. But, since we're expressions here, we go forget that claim. So, um, <laughs> yes, well, they stripped me of my letters and scissors when I left, so I don't own nothing. Anyway, um, so um, you just look at, you say straight lines. I define straight line to be a segment in the open disk. Open is important. And I say that they're parallel if, they don't intersect in the open disk. Voila. Here's our geometry. Well, it's not so clear because right, you want other properties of a geometry other than being, a, being drawable on the board. 
For example, you want the asymmetry group to be transitive, uh, and that's not obvious here. So you have to say a bit more, but basically this is it. The really amazing thing about this, and I think that's what amazed Sakari and Boya and Lobachevsky, is once you negate the parallel postulate in this way, so every line there's an infinity of lines parallel, everything is determined up to one real number, which is the curvature which, which you can scale by. It's really amazing. And what's also amazing is that you, I drew this picture, and due to my inferior drawing skills, uh, this object clearly is not a disk. It is some, uh, well, actually, it's not even convex, but, uh, but let's assume for the sake of argument it was convex. Then <coughs> you can do the same thing with any convex, convex object. And in fact, Hilbert did just that. He defined a distance if these points are x, a, b, y, then you define distance between a and b to be half the log of the cro cross ratio of the points in order. Order is important. x, a, b, y, which actually, if, the, if you start with a disk, this actually gives you the hyperbolic metric. The 1 half is there to make curvature minus 1. Um, and the amazing thing is that's all you ever get. What I mean by that is if you have a disk, you have a hyperbolic metric. If you have an ellipse, you also have a hyperbolic metric. If you have neither a disk nor an ellipse, you don't get a Riemannian space. In fact, this was a PhD thesis of a student of Hilbert named Finsler. <coughs> and what you get is Finsler metrics, or Hilbert Finsler metrics, depending on whether you believe that uh, advisors should publish with their students or not. And uh, actually, interestingly, you can do this not just for convex objects, but for any quadric. And you get interesting things. For example, if the quadric is, so you can do the same thing for the complement of, of the hyperbolic disk. And then you get, instead of distances, you get angles, and you get the spaces and whatnot. And actually, this guy, a friend of mine, Schlenker, has been working on this and proved some amusing things. All right. So, uh, so this interestingly shows that hyperbolic geometry is very rigid, right? You would think that if you twiddle this domain a little bit, you would get something similar, but you don't. So maybe it's just a curiosity, right? So you construct some weird model, and you get the space, and uh, now what? And so after waiting for 2,000 years or 2,500 years, discovered people didn't really do anything with it for the f next 50 years. Now, Lobachevsky, for reasons that are a mystery to me, spent the rest of his life base pretty much computing volumes in the hyperbolic space. Now, the question is, who cares? And I'm not sure if people asked him this, but he probably didn't care because he had tenure and he could do whatever he wanted. And, um, and then, amazingly, this actually turned out to be useful. So, and what is interesting is that now hyperbolic geometry has become pervasive. And let's start with some, I guess, combinatorial questions, which have absolutely nothing to do with geometry, a priori. So the first one, which actually I heard about in the late 80s when I was uh, at the Stanford Computer Science Department, a guy, Stanford at the time had an OR department, which doesn't exist anymore. It was merged, I mean, there's so many. Stanford is like corporations, so they keep doing organizations every couple of years. So they rolled this department back into the EE department or something. But that's a subject for a different talk. Um, so here's the question. I give you a cube. Well, actually, this is just one example of a cube. I give you an n cube. And I ask you. Uh, how many simplices do I need to triangulate this cube? So this is a question which is known as the, this quantity is known as the simplexity of a cube. It's a good name, I'm not denying that. And um, so how many simplices do you need? So there is, a trivial upper bound. What is a trivial upper bound? The trivial upper bound is, 
Well, we think of a cube, as many of us do, as the set of points in Rn with all coordinates between 0 and 1. And then you take the simplex, which we call S, is the set of n tuples such that, well, they're all non negative, and they're ordered this way. This is a simplex. That's fairly easy to see. Or if it's not easy, I'll leave it to you as next says. Well, the point is that if I look at all the permutations, so call this S identity. S sigma is instead of this order, we take some permutation of the, of the coordinates, and we do that. So obviously, the cube is a union of these S sigma. So C is a union of S sigma, which gives an upper bound on this quantity of n factorial. The question is, is that the truth? So the answer is no, it is not the truth. And first, actually, I don't remember who did this. Hughes, I think, was the guy's name. Using some kind of uh, volume arguments in Euclidean space, he showed that Tn, which is the simplexity, is so it's clearly less than or equal to n factorial, and is greater than or equal to. They're actually better upper bounds, but I'm not going to talk about them. Um, is greater than um, 2 to the n, n factorial divided by n plus 1 to the n plus 1 over 2. Um, and then there was a, this was improved by a person called Warren Smith, who some of you might know. Who was a student here, a student of Conway, Tarjan, and Dobkin. So he's very illustrious advisors and a very smart guy. So he improved this to this. Six, square root of six to the n times the same quantity. So square root of six is bigger than two. And so it's better bound. And he used hyperbolic geometry to do this. And how did he do this? So what I didn't tell you about hyperbolic geometry, and the people were, again, shocked by this revelation, is that, as I said, once you fix the scale, suddenly you can compute everything. In particular, you can compute the area of a triangle with angles alpha, beta, and gamma. And I'm sure, again, as most people here know, this is, so the area is equal to pi minus alpha minus beta minus gamma. That's kind of amazing, right, people say. How could this be? This must be wrong. I mean, this is people like Sakari who are discovering these kind of facts and said, my god, this is clearly crap. <laughs> but, uh, but no. And then you observe that actually if you draw this triangle or a triangle like this, which is known in the trade as an ideal triangle, you can see it in this picture, but the angles are all zero. And so the area of this triangle is equal to pi. Now, it's fairly obvious that any triangle is contained in one like this. And therefore, the area of a triangle in hyperbolic space is bounded above by pi. That's, that's crazy. It's, I mean, it's, the space looks finite, but it's not, right? Because this, this is a so-called ideal boundary. It's infinitely far away. And in fact, if you take a ball, or a disk, if you want, around a point, and you look at the disk of radius r, it's going to be much, much larger than the Euclidean disk of radius r. And yet, triangles are bound in size. What's more, which is kind of weird, is I can draw you many triangles, all of those vertices are at infinity. And even though they don't look like this, they're actually all the same. Well, that's pretty weird also. But so that doesn't continue in higher dimensions. But the fact that the volume of a simplex is bounded is true in all dimensions. And you would think this is the kind of thing that would be discovered by Lobachevsky, but it wasn't. So there's a theorem of, amazing theorem, well, actually, I'm not sure how amazing it is, but of uh, Hagerup and Mankum, which was published 
surprisingly recently in ACTA, no less, I think 81, that regular simplex is of maximal volume. of all simplices in HN. Now, this fact is so canonical that you think there should be a two-line proof of this. But that paper is long and tedious and does horrible analysis. Uh, in three dimensions, actually, I'm not sure if Lobachevsky knew that the regular simplex was one of the maximum volume. Maybe he did. In, in three dimensions, it's a theorem in 3D, it's much nicer than that. Because what you get is, see here, the area is a linear function of the angles. In three dimensions, volume is a convex, or actually concave, function of the dihedral angles. So I, I actually discovered this, and uh, it was like one of these shocking things. Why didn't anybody see this before? So this immediately shows that the regular simplex is one of the maximum volume, right, because you symmetrize it. <coughs> I don't know if anything like this is true in dimension bigger than 3, by the way. So if you want an interesting question, there's one. Um, OK. So this is a good thing, because you can prove things like most rigidity using this fact, but also because a regular simplex, you can actually use the half space model and draw it, and you can write down an integral for what the volume is. And you can estimate the integral. And so that's exactly what Smith did. What you do is you write, you estimate asymptotically the volume of the regular n cube as n goes to n is large. And similarly, you estimate the volume of the n regular n simplex. And since any simplex is smaller than the regular one, if you divide the volume of a regular n cubed by the volume of the regular n simplex, you get a lower bound on how many simplices you need. Very simple, but quite effective. Now notice, by the way, that in three dimensions, for the, for the same reason that I gave here, it is known that the regular n cubed is one of maximal volume. In higher dimensions, as far as I know, that's not known, because you know, you probably need another active paper to, uh, to prove this fact, which I think ACTA can only accept a finite number of papers on hyperbolic polyhedra. So uh, anyway, so that was the argument. So this uh, kind of like, you look at the first question, you say, well, what does hyperbolic geometry have to do with this? Why should this work better? We don't know. It's, uh, this talk is too confused, not too enlightened. Um, so let's give another combinatorial example. And this is a paper which was sort of happening many centuries ago when I was a graduate student. Um, so here's a question which was asked by actually data structure people. So look at two, two binary trees. What is a binary tree? A binary tree has a root, and then it has some interior nodes, and each interior node has two children, and then eventually there are leaf nodes which have no children. So take two such trees, uh, let's see. the reason I was confused is because I want them to have the same number of interior nodes. So any two trees with the same number of interior nodes can be transform transformed one into the other by a procedure that's called tree rotations. What does that mean? So uh, here we have node A, B, C. So here's what we do. First, we take this tree. We leave this part, the part above all this mess, alone. It, doesn't, it just grabs whoever's, whoever's on top. So we take this subtree, and we pick it up by B. So now we have a b here, right? Well, there's still the, the root somewhere. And then it has a, call this c and d. Oh, actually, we already have a c, e and f. 
um, E, F, and then A just has some C. Now you say, but that's wrong. That's not the binary tree anymore. Exactly. So we take the middle, the middle leaf, the middle child of B, and give it to A. And that's what's called the rotation. So the question is, so it's fairly easy to see that any tree can be transformed into any other tree by a sequence of rotations. But the question that was asked by mankind at the time is, how many rotations do you need? And there were many papers in, in improving bounds and whatnot. And you could prove an upper bound, which is 2n minus 6. If the trees have n interior nodes, you need 2n minus 6 rotations to move one to the other. Or, I mean, you need at most that many. But people didn't know if it was sharp. There was a result of, I think, Lipton that said you need 7, 7 6 n was the lower bound. Well, then Slater, Tarjan, and Thurston proved that 2n minus 6 rotations is sharp. And how did they do this? Not combinatorially, you think, but no. Not at all. So first observation, which I presumably was known before, before then, was that there's a correspondence between trees with n plus 2, I'm oh, sorry, between n interior nodes and triangulations of a polygon with n vertices. So you take a polygon with, how so? Well, here's a polygon. You can triangulate it. And the way you think about it, well, it's, you call this, this edge the root edge. Call it R. And now, if the root node has children A and B, then you call this triangle A and this triangle B, and then you go on like that. So it's fairly easy to see that there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between trees and triangulations of an n gon. But better than that, so, okay, so, so what? This rotation operation, which looks a bit goofy at first, it's actually the same as an edge flip, a diagonal flip on a pair of triangles. So then the question is, can be restated in a manner much more pleasing to those of us geometrically inclined. What is the diameter of the flip graph of an n gun? And um, so how did they attack this problem? What they do is they say, OK, take the beginning n gun and the ending n gun and glue them together. What do you get? You get a planar triangle. You get a triangulation of the sphere. Now. The idea is that, so here's a blown up picture of a flip. Notice it looks exactly like a projection of a simplex of a tetrahedron onto the plane. And there's a reason for that. You can think of a flip as gluing in a tetrahedron. So if you have some number of flips, that means you can triangulate the, uh, this polyhedron with that many tetrahedra. So now all you need to do is find a polyhedron of very large volume. Because you know that there's an upper bound on the volume of the biggest possible tetrahedron. So if your polyhedron has that many faces and has large volume, then you don't need, you need at least as many as the volume divided by the volume of the regular tetrahedron. And in a somewhat more technical part of the paper, they actually construct polyhedra of very large volume. So you can construct polyhedra with volume with arbitrarily close to 2n minus 10. Why 10, not 6? Because you lose 2 when you go in this translation. Times the volume of the regular RDL simplex. Again, and you use sort of a geometric function theory to do this. Now again, the, this is a completely combinatorial problem. And yet, uh, you, you use this complete geometric method. Why? Why is hyperbolic geometry actually useful for this? It seems like a grotesque sideways move. And yet it works. I mean, there's no other proof of this result that I don't know of. Um, now, by the way, I think, so this question of this flip graph, if you look at surfaces which are not the polygon, 
this comes up all the time, I think, in uh, mathematical physics, for example. And I think the, the geometry of this flip graph is of great interest, and very little about it is known, or at least not enough of it was, is known. And one question that was obvious and is known is that it's actually even connected. So I know of uh, here, for polygons, it's easy, right? because you, you move all the edges so that they all come out of one vertex. Uh, but for surfaces, the most conceptual argument I know actually also goes to hyperbolic geometry. You use the fact that Teichmuller space is connected. And then you use the theorem that there is a Euclidean surface in each conformal class. And then that surface has a delta triangulation, which can be whatever you want, because you can just make a surface out of, you can make a belly surface, right, out of right, equilateral triangles. And then as you move along your Teichmuller space, the delta triangulation changes by flips. And therefore, the space is connected. But that is, again, almost as roundabout as this argument. But these kind of questions of what the diameter of the space is, or given two triangulations, how to best connect them, that's the approximations known, and the heuristics, and this and that. But there's no truth known. So again, maybe hyperbolic geometry is a friend. Now, but maybe it's not. And here's, a, here's my last remark, is the other example, which everybody here knows, I mean, people didn't know what to do with hyperbolic geometry for a long time. And then they realized that every surface, other than the two stupid ones, are hyperbolic. And then another 100 years passed, and they said, well, actually, essentially, every three manifolds is hyperbolic also. Good times, right? Hyperbolic everywhere. But no. Once you move to dimension greater than three, nothing is hyperbolic. Well, groups are, but manifolds are not. So maybe it's just because we're too stupid to think of the next great thing that we are stuck in uh, low dimensions with hyperbolic geometry. Um, maybe, so maybe for these, like the simplexity thing, maybe if you construct the right Einstein metric on something and figure out what a cube is, which is not obvious. No? <laughs> Didn't Hamilton already do a sales rep on, on that? <laughs> yeah. So, so anyway, to close, Hyperbolic geometry, even though it took forever to discover, and first was viewed as a completely you know, botanical curiosity, the amazing thing is it's pervasive. And even though I've been working on it for quite some time, I still don't understand why. It just is. So I don't know, it's food for thought, or just another fact to remember in your travels, or whatever. I'll stop here.